<laughs> and welcome, my beautiful beans. Today, we are talking about novel writing. Writing of novels. It's a big old subject because they're big old books. Isn't that right, Delona? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, sorry, cat. The cat has come to help me today. Um, you may see her fragging in and out from the green screen. You are welcome. Uh, because novel writing is really important and my cat recognizes that. So my beans, get your questions in, get them in because we will be answering them at the end of this live stream in, oh, I guess 50 minutes from now. Uh, but in the meantime, may I introduce once again, the highlight of <laughs> many writing streams, the amazing Delena Ma, teacher at the Lawson Writers Academy. She writes as Delena Ma. She runs a small indie publishing company called Heart Ally Books. I love that name. She's a web uh, design, she, sorry, and a web design company for authors. Uh, uh, she has written two of your finest novels, Sisterhood and the Dominion of Darkness, uh, which are also published. And uh, yeah, in general, Delena is an amazing person to, talk, person to talk about the subject because not only does she see it from a writer who's written and published novels, she sees it um, as a teacher who has helped others write and publish novels and as a publisher who does the literal publishing in between. So uh, <laughs> if there's anybody who can help us get our novel from, holy crap, I think I have an idea, to, <laughs> oh my goodness, I have a novel, I think it's Delena. Thank you. <laughs> what are you doing? Are you are you up for helping us today? I I love helping people with their writing. I, writing is magic to me, and it's like, you know, my passion since I was tiny. So yeah, everything books. Yeah, I feel that. I feel that. <laughs> I think we should start though at the beginning because you know I've alluded to I have an idea, but sometimes it's not even that easy. Sometimes it's I want to write. I'm <laughs> desperate to write. What am I writing about? <laughs> how how do you overcome that, Delona? Well, I, I think a lot of it is, one, one of the things I like is you and I are on the opposite ends of the spectrum in everything in, in writing, which I love. Um, for me, it's, I start daydreaming about characters. Um, for a lot of people, it's, you know, you think about what you want to accomplish, what you want to tell, what story do you want to tell? Um, and just giving yourself permission to daydream and think and come up with ideas. Um, that's, that's pretty much it for me. It's like, I, I try to get a big concept and then find characters that fit in with that concept and then keep going. Yeah, absolutely. Um, for me, it comes from the world building. It comes from the setting. I've talked about this before. Um, I would never say write like this, write, uh, rather than like that, write however you want. But for me, it's the agile novel writing method. It's starting with a world. It's exploring the people and the stories that you could tell in that world until things start to, until you can't resist writing. That's that's how it works for me. Like I will start with the world building of the setting creation and the, the different people in this place and what are their struggles. And all of a sudden, I just, I can't stop myself from being like, it, it's a book, it's a book. It has to happen. This is my book. So that's where it comes from for me. Yeah. And then it grows and it becomes a series of books, right? Yes, horrifically. <laughs> <laughs> it's not supposed to. We can talk about that later if we get onto publishing. We will see how far we get in this journey. But I think once you have that idea wherever it comes from, and for everybody it's different, folks in the chat, feel free to share where your ideas come from. I was Sharon is Karen. What can I say? Uh, where do you start writing? Like, how do you how do you eat the elephant, as it were? <laughs> like, you have an idea for a book, and somewhere on the other side of that idea is the finished book. How mm -hmm. do you get from idea to finished book? Mm -hmm. um, I think the meta is is really huge. Is going ahead and writing out why you're writing this story, why your where your motivation is, every little bit of music, every little bit of imagery, every you know video that you've watched that inspires you, getting all of that together um, in one place, and then from there, starting to you know, in, in so many things I, I do, I just talk about figuring out who you are and what you want to do, and then figuring out who your readers are and the story that they're going to want to read. Um, a lot of people skip who's going to read this. 
um, and or the worst is, well, everybody's going to read this now, unless you're J.K. Rowling, um, and you know, then you, um, you know, you go back to to who you are, and are you the kind of person who likes to experiment? Are you the kind of person who gets bored? Um, if, if, you know, I have a friend who cannot read a book unless she reads the ending first and make sure it's going to be okay. Now, if she was a novelist, she would be a plotter. She yes. would have to plot it out. Me, if I've read the end of the book, I'm not going to read the book. So yeah. I'm a pantser. And so it's like, I have to just kind of figure out generally where I want it to go and, you know, get, get in that way. So that's, you know, it's, it's a lot of it's figuring out your process. Um, and if anybody tells you, you should absolutely do it this way, then, then ignore them. Um. Absolutely. <laughs> I think it's all about pass through. That's how I like to see it. Like there is a mountain range there. You've got to climb the mountain. Everybody approaches it a different way and that is okay. And so what we're doing today is to, we're talking about paths through the mountain. Mm -hmm. Um, how do you get to the foothills on the other side? So um, yeah, today is not about prescriptive advice and you must do it this way. It's all about these are the ways we approach. This is what has helped us. This is what has helped the people we have helped. Mm -hmm. and, and when things get stressful, because they will, I mean, it's, you're, you're doing such a huge thing, you know, you, maybe you make a weekend, maybe you make it a month and maybe you make it two years in and, and then you decide, you know, you, what am I doing? You know, and everybody, first of all, recognizing that everybody hits that moment. Every yeah. single person does hit that moment. I've talked to some really big name authors and they've hit that moment. And going back to that meta of why I'm doing it, what I want to do, why am I doing this can help you, you know, get through that. And then just, you just show up, you know, button the chair, fingers on the keyboard. Yeah. Funnily enough, so little name drop. Quincy's Tavern and I are friends on Twitter. Mm. We've chatted like twice. He's great. I like him a lot. If you don't know who he is, he's a TikTok star. He he has a, a, a fantasy tavern on TikTok. It's really cool. I love the concept. Um, and he was saying, uh, I've just started picking up my old love of writing again. And I was like, that's amazing. Good luck. Get those writing hours in. Um, mm -hmm. And he was like, oh, I don't know if I can. And I was like, honestly, it is the best way. Like, however you do it, showing up for your writing every day is it's the best way to get through the mountain range, honestly, is what mm -hmm. I can say. It is it is the equivalent of, okay, I'm never going to get to the other side of the mountains if I do not put one foot in front of the other. Whether I'm going through the tunnel or over the top or around the side, or I, you know, I end up retracing my steps, you still have to put one foot in front of the other. That's the that's the showing up. That's the butt in chair, words mm -hmm. on the page, bit of it. Mm-hmm. That's it. It's like that that writing, I not excuse me, that walking challenge that they're doing now with the, you know, they've got the the walk the you know halls of Mordor or whatever. Oh yeah. It's just, you know, you just every step that you take counts, even if it's just a few steps that day. You know, and so it's it's huge. Yeah. Adds yeah, up absolutely. over time. So we've talked about where to start, and I love that you mentioned the meta. I am here for the meta. You know that, like, the matter is my bay. Um, and that, that is, honestly, that is one of the ways that I start. One of the ways when I'm first formulating an idea, often I will write a book blurb. And the book blurb may not be the book that I end up with on the other side of the mountain. But going in, that's the core of the idea. That's the, this is my talisman when it gets mm -hmm. hard. This is where I'm going. This is this is what I think my book is right now. Um mm -hmm. We'll talk about revisions and editing later, but this is what I think my book is right now. Um, and then we haven't mentioned the dreaded, I mean, this is the writer's PVP, right? Plotter versus Panzer. Mm -hmm. Can you speak a little bit about that and maybe finding finding your space between the, the two sort of extremes yeah. there? Yeah, well, and it is, It's it's, you know, everything is on a spectrum. And you've got, you know, your pure plotters who have to have everything outlined and they have to have every scene, you know, they're, um, where they start, where, where pure plotter starts 
is almost the equivalent of my first draft because mm -hmm. their, their outlines are so extensive. Um, and then you've got the pantser who just wants to sit down and just start clicking keys and see what comes out, right? And then you've got everything in between. You've got, and there's so many structural methods out there that you can you can explore. I, I'm Randy Ingermanson is the one I was trying to remember. He's the one who does the snowflake method. Mm. And that's very similar to what you're talking about is writing that blurb first and, and doing that, um, which is great because it makes it easier on the other end when you're trying to market. Um, but, you know, you can, you can set yourself up with, you know, you can be in the middle where you can say, okay, I am going to write this draft and I want this book to be about, you know, 50 to 70,000 words. And this is my first draft. So maybe I'm aiming at 50. Okay. So I want the midpoint to be at about 25,000 words. And you can, you can set yourself up with, with like waypoints that you know, when you've hit them. Um, and I love the manuscript feature for that, by the way when I was testing this out, um, I, I set up chapters with the different mm -hmm. waypoints. And then in the chapter outline, I'm like, okay, this is where I want to be. And this is what I need to cover. And just, so it's just got these, these few little points. Um, as somebody who's more of a plotter will fill out more detail, you know? Yes. Um, a lot of people are asking questions like, uh, wait, that was a really good one. How do you make it through the planning stage? I'm a massive plotter and also the sort that needs to know the end of the novel because I'm a mm -hmm. control freak in all honesty, but often I get bored very quickly. So, ten, ten, uh, no, how do you say it? Clothes pegs. You know how mm -hmm. you have on a, on a washing line, you have clothes pegs. So you have pins that hold the clothes in place. That is how you start plotting. Mm -hmm. It is the same. So you will have pins that hold the bits of the story that you know what they are in place. And then you will go in and fill in the middle bits. Now, you may find that you start writing bits of the story and then going back to the plotting and then going back to the story. That is a form of plancing. Mm -hmm. People do this. It's okay. You can. You may find that you write a really clear outline and then you don't end up following it completely. <laughs> That's what I do. I write a really detailed outline. I mean, really detailed. Like sometimes I'm doing five senses on scenes in a an outline before I have written the book. Mm -hmm. But I don't always stick to it because sometimes by the time I get there, my characters have made different choices or I, you know, things have gone differently or something that made perfect sense on my plot. As I start writing it, I'm like, oh, this is a much better idea. I should do it this way. Mm -hmm. So don't feel like just because you like to plot, don't feel like you have to stick to that plot. That plot is a, a rough draft. It is your, like Delena was saying, it is your draft zero. Just like when discovery writers write, they will write something out and they're like, I don't know where I'm going, but I'm having really fun getting there. And you'll get to the end of the story and you'll be like, I kind of know what's going on with my story. Ish. <laughs> and I already know that the stuff I said in chapter seven that I have said differently in chapter 15. And there's a character that says the same thing three times. And there's some business. That, for me, it's always this business with a chair. There's always some, like my characters sit down far, far more often than they get up. So I can only imagine <laughs> that they are sitting down on increasingly small chairs. But um, <laughs> it's first draft. It doesn't matter. And I think that a lot of plotters feel like they have, if they're plotting, they have to stick to the plot, stick to the plan. And you have to give yourself the freedom to know I can plan enough mm -hmm. and I don't have to plan more. And the plan is a guideline. It doesn't control me. Um, yeah. And it's very difficult because the people who are plotters are like, can be type A personalities. I'm not oh, yeah. saying you are, but we can be type A personalities. We can get very particular about things. And while that's great for some things in writing, like editing, it's it can be really hard for the first draft. You gotta you gotta mm -hmm. let some stuff go. Um, that's how I recommend it, and that's also how I don't get bored in draft one because often mm -hmm. I will look at the plot and whatever I planned, I will throw it out the window, or I'll move it around completely. And if you're getting find yourself getting bored, make sure that you're not over plotting recognize that you can still be in control. You can still have control of that novel if you've just placed the tent pegs, right? The, the little clothespin pegs, I'm sorry. You know, you've, you've, 
you've got to find the place that you're most comfortable with. And a lot of times it different on your second novel and your third novel too. Different novels, different things. So um, like one time I heard Janet say, maybe we get more towards the middle the more we write. And I and I think you might be onto something there. Um, because it, but if you find yourself getting bored, you're either, you know, missing a point, you're driving your characters in a direction they don't want to go in, or you're being too, probably maybe too detailed or something like that. You've got to give yourself more freedom. Let yourself come out and play. And yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I would also say if you're bored with what you're writing, skip to a different bit of the plot. Mm -hmm. You have a plot, you know what's going to happen. Yeah. It's fine. You can just join those bits up later, right in the middle later. And often what, so that, that happens to me. And often what will happen is I'll skip to a bit more exciting and then I'll go back to glue them together and I'll be like, I don't really need this scene at all actually nothing's happening the character is sitting by themselves doing f all excuse me um you know soliloquizing in their head why is this here screw it it's either i'm going to set something on fire or we're going to move on um and and often when we plot we get very particular about all the little details and we forget that sometimes you can say two weeks later they had arrived at the port um, you, when we're thinking through the story, when we're thinking through the plot, we think I, you must, you know, make every step. And as a writer, you must make every step, but the reader doesn't always have to read every step. Yeah. We've got on a little bit of a tangent now. I'm sorry about that. Uh, I'm very passionate about plotting. I'm very passionate about pantsing. I'm very passionate, passionate about the spectrum of the plants. But, um, I think however you approach your first draft, you got to approach your first draft. Like that is, yeah. for me, that is hurdle number two. Number one is I want to write a novel and this is what it's about. And number two is, and I've written the first draft. So whatever you need to do to get yourself there is what I would say to do. Maybe Delena has more specific advice though. I, I love that. Also, um, words are not precious. Yes. Um, when you're in the first draft, they are not precious. Um, I worked with a writer who said, I don't want to waste my writing time. I don't want to waste any writing. I don't want to have to cut 10,000 words later. And I went, gosh, I'm so sorry that that's this industry. Um, and, you know, words are just things that you, you will change. You will throw them away. You will rewrite this thing. Um, the magic happens in the editing. So just recognize that. If you've got a draft and there's a section that there's, you know, square brackets, and then there you say something cool happens here, and then you just keep going, that's perfect. Yeah. yeah. Uh, very lightweight, but I think extra good for pantsers is a book called Stop Worrying, Start Writing by Sarah mm. Painter. It's small. Mm -hmm. It's very nice to read. Um, it's like a big warm hug in a mug. Um, she is, she is very... She's a very warm person. Uh, we've had her on the podcast before, actually. And uh, yeah, it's a very nice book, particularly for beginner writers. I think that's that's very good of being like, don't worry, everybody writes nonsense sometimes. That's normal. Mm -hmm. It's part of the process. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so somehow, by hell or by high water, we have thought of an idea for our novel. We have made that idea into something more solid and then we have turned that idea into a first draft. What do our first, what does our first draft look like, Delena? Um, really messy. <laughs> it's going to have total, you know, things going the wrong direction um, and extra pieces that don't belong and pieces that are in the wrong place and uh, characters' names that change halfway through. Um, for me, it's always eye color that changes three times during the book. Um, you know, it, it's, it's there, it's on the page and it should be celebrated and treasured. It should not be published. Um, <laughs> it should not be allowed for anybody to read. Um, <laughs> but it's, you've got, you've got something beautiful there. Um, like a diamond in the rough is, is, is probably the best analogy. Yeah. yeah. So we have our first draft. It is our baby. What do we do with it? If you have time and patience, stick it in a drawer for a couple of weeks and then come back to it. 
um, because the first time you read it, especially the closer to the writing that you are. So let's say you, you finish it and you immediately go, okay, I finished it. Now I'm going to go back and I'm going to read it. And that same day you start reading it from the first. Um, you're going to disappoint yourself. You're going to go, oh, this is garbage. Um, because we all see our writing through this magnifying lens, you know. Um, and if you can put it aside for a week, and then come back, you'll read it and go, oh, hey, that's that's pretty good. You'll see the good parts versus the bad parts. There's good parts and bad parts. They're there for everybody. You want to get to the place where you have enough distance where you can see, um, you know, there's good stuff here. There's really good stuff here. Okay, yeah, that's not so great. I can polish that up and, and work that way. Um, yeah. I think the, the, the distance thing is something that people underestimate. Mm -hmm. So... A million years ago, I used to be a singer, professional singer, opera singer. That was my job. Um, and sometimes there would be recordings of my concerts. Sometimes they would even go out. Um, and I would cringe horribly. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons is that I would remember how it felt performing things. And sometimes things felt, you know, if you were having a bad day or you were on the edge of a cold thing, some things felt a little bit unsteady. And sometimes things felt amazing. Like it just felt like everything was working. There was no guarantee that that was audible on the recording. Yeah, absolutely none. And it's the same with writing. Sometimes you'll be writing something and be like, "Oh, I'm writing at my best. My prose, it's so beautiful. I'm using such eloquent words." And then you go back and read it, and you're like, "This is nonsense. Why did I think this was good?" And then a bit where you really struggle to like just get the bits on the page. You'll go back and read it, and you'll be like, "Oh." This is a lot better than I remember because it didn't feel good coming out onto the page. Sometimes you judge your writing very harshly. So mm -hmm. by leaving space, you get to distance the production feel with the actual product that you have created. And I think that's so important because sometimes as a writer, we write our best things on our worst days. We write our worst things on our best days. That the way it feels coming out is no guarantee of the quality as it sits on the page. And uh, it's really hard to have perspective on that unless you've given it some time. Yeah. I don't know if that happens to you as well, Delena, but it happens to me all the time. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's it's terrible. I, I have to, I'm one of those people who has to let it sit aside for a while, for a while. In fact, they were talking, you know, which, which nano are you working on? I'm editing 2019. You know, I, I needed the distance from that um, to, I'm to get to particular. Yes. I'm not yes. kidding. That's what I'm editing right now. Yes. You know, I, it's, I have a whole series that I, I drafted over a series of nanos. And now I'm going back and going, okay, it's time to get these out. <laughs> it's getting a little ridiculous. But then realizing, you know, I, I what I've come to realize was I actually needed to write all of those because the story unfolds over several stories and several arcs. And now I need to take, well, this needs to come out of book three and go into book one. And this needs to come out of book one and go into book four. It's like, oh, dear. And you, you can know. do that macro organization now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which I couldn't have if I had just finished, you know, draft one Just finish one and put it out yeah yeah so how does the editing process work now this was something that took me a really long time to figure out mm -hmm. editing is hard or at least it was for me so I'm yeah. really curious to hear from you how do you recommend to your students that they go about approaching editing so most of my students are at Lawson Writers Academy so I have a I have an advantage there because Margie Lawson teaches editing that's what she ah. teaches. And so, you know, without giving away any of her trademarked pieces, um, she is really good about teaching people to go through and look at the novel as a whole and break down in each scene what you need to have. For example, if you've changed, um, if you've changed chapters or even just changed scene, you have to start with a little bit of setting even though you're like, well, we were here this last time and we're here this next time, we don't, we're in the same place. The reader doesn't know that, so you have to reorient them. And and so she's really good at, at helping people see that. Um, the other thing she does is she teaches using rhetorical devices, using things that empower your writing. So that's when you bring out your editorial skills. You know, I, I say that when you're when you're 
writing for me as a pantser, I have to hog tie my editor and throw them in a closet and lock the door. Um, sorry. <laughs> and then, and then when I'm, you know, when I'm editing, they get to come out. The only problem is that then they're a little cranky with me. So we're working on that a little bit. Editing is not my, my strong point because my editor is still barely speaking to me. Um, but <laughs> wait, just to be know, clear, is this your internal editor? Or my your internal ex editor. Yeah. My external editor is fabulous. She's she's always talking to me, but my internal editor just is like, no, you treat me badly. Um, you don't respect me. And I'm like, this is your time to shine. This is yours. Have fun now. You can play now. It's yours to play with now. And and she's like, Yes, fine, I'll play with it. Maybe. You know? <laughs> but you know, that's when the magic starts happening. Um, and that's when you can take a scene and you're like, okay, the scene is almost okay, but gosh, it would really need, oh, this happens in the end of the book. Okay. I can set that up now, yeah. you know, where you can weave through those threads. Um, and, and so that's, you know, it's just, it's magic. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's really important, um, for new writers to realize that editing comes in waves. Yeah. A lot of new writers will sit down at the beginning of the book and start polishing their prose. But that is a very dangerous thing if you're going to be hacking out scenes and rewriting characters and changing character traits. And, you know, if you're reorganizing the book, which I had to do, for example, I had, my, mm -hmm. I had characters go all the way to Sweden in the first draft of my novel. And I was like, what are you doing in Sweden? Get back here. <laughs> You're supposed to be in Italy. Stop it. <laughs> Behave yourselves. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. This was a thing that I had to completely rewrite. There was this yeah. whole arc of the book that just got chopped. If I had spent a month polishing those um, chapters to a shine, only to realize they had to be chopped, mm -hmm. that would have been heartbreaking. Yeah. So start with the big things. On your read through, go through big plot. Are you missing things? Are there loopholes? Have you accidentally got weird Insta travel from one place to another because you forgot to put anything in about it? Um, are the do the characters are, are the characters appearing to you as you want them to appear? Do you have two characters who should be one character, for example? That that's something that a lot of new writers will do. Well, they'll have um, you know they'll have all of these side characters, and suddenly you realize that actually they're all doing the same job in the book. So they could be combined, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, are you happy with your ending? Do you feel like it's doing your, your, your journey justice? Or does your ending need a rewrite? And if your ending needs a rewrite, what do you need to do about it? Again, that's where I would recommend, and this is how I did it. I had a whole plot for my first draft. I followed the plot. Uh, some things happened. Generally, I followed the plot. And then I went and got this book again. That's Save the Cat Writes a Novel. And I replotted the major beats to figure out why it wasn't working, why it was very soggy in the middle. Um, and that's where I used the template to tighten up what I already knew was a basically fine plot that needed tightening. And you can go back to these books again and again. They are very useful for that. Uh, you can check out, again, other things. Um, the other books I showed, the character arc book, is your character arc reading true? Do they suddenly have a personality transplant halfway through the book? Is that too sudden? Is that something you need to pace? These are the things that you need to be thinking about in your developmental edit so that you don't start polishing prose you're going to chop. Yeah. Um, so first of all, fix the big stuff. One of the ways I do this is with an alpha reader. Um, Stephen King says, write with the door closed, rewrite with the door open. I think that's very wise. Um, I have an alpha reader that I can trust enough mm -hmm. to read a first or a 1.5 draft to. That is my husband. I'm very lucky. Mm -hmm. Not everyone has that. Someone like yeah. a critique partner can be helpful for that as well, where if you're reading a novel and you're like, I don't know what's wrong with it. I just know something's wrong. It's big. It's developmental. It's got an issue. Putting it in front of somebody else's eyes who understands that this is... Draft one, draft 1.5, 1 and it, 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 it's not there yet, and you know it's not there, that can be really, really helpful. So after the developmental edit, which is where you move about the big pieces, you fill in the gaps, what happens next? <sighs> so talking about books, I don't have a book to show you. 
but I will tell you, um, Margie Lawson's Empowering Characters Emotions is a lecture yes. packet that you do and you go through it with your novel. So it's an, it's yeah. an interactive um, and it's very inexpensive. Um, but that's, you know, you start going through and you start thinking, is this strong enough? What do I need to do to make this po more powerful? Um, what is detracting? What is enhancing? Um, that's when you can start polishing things up. Um, and, and getting things better. And, and I loved your topic, topic about, you know, a beta, an alpha reader that you can trust. Um, I, I have a, a client who's struggling to finish a book and I was out and I happened to run into her husband. Most of my people aren't local, but this one is. And he was like, I'm so sorry. And I'm like, why are you sorry? He goes, she asked me to read her book. And I said this, and she hasn't been able to write for, months because of oh, that no. yeah yeah and and you know it's it's now you're not now you now you're stressing every time you see your husband not even that you know my husband's like i'm not reading your work <laughs> he just doesn't read it um so you have to have somebody you really trust um i, I had a friend um who's a writer who said what do i do my friend asked me to read their book and a comment on it mm. and i said okay what draft stage is this at and how good is this friend and, you know, he's like, well, you know, I, I think this person really wants me to just say it's good. I'm like, okay, pass, pass. Because if you give an honest opinion, you lose a friend, you know? <laughs> so you need somebody who you can trust, you know, to, you know, and I, when I do edits for people, I always say, so what are you looking for? You know, <laughs> how, how harsh do you want me to be? Cause I can get really dark. Um, you know, <laughs> it's like, this has to be ripped out and this has to be ripped out. And I'm not trying to be mean. It's just, no. you know, your character arc, for example, if you've got your character arc wrong or whatever, it's the developmental that you're talking about. But after you get past that developmental, then it's all in the polishing stages and looking at the flow to make sure it's flowing smoothly, making sure that there's a hook at the end of each chapter making sure that the reader is kept enchanted. If, if there's a part that's, you know, boring, set something on fire, um, you know, take that, it that out. That is my solution in case you're wondering, like <laughs> I just, I just randomly set things on fire in my book, it helps. Or, you know, insert dinosaur, but. Um, <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. I know, Carry I know. <laughs> you know, the podcast is gonna be very confused. Go on. <laughs> But you just, you know, you go through until you've got it really well polished. And yeah. then that's when you're ready to to start looking at beta readers. I think mm -hmm. that's when you're ready to go with a little bit, bit riskier reader um, and get that feedback. And somehow you've got to distance your emotions from it enough that you can get honest feedback. <clears throat> you can ask for honest feedback and you can get the honest feedback. And then you can decide if you're going to listen to it or not. You know? <laughs> I'd recommend um, writing body language and dialogue cues from Margie mm, Lawson again. Nice. Um, one of the techniques that she teaches is, you know, she, she'll teach you how to do body language. because She's a psychologist, right? Um, but then she also teaches you, um, you know, there's things that can come out sounding writerly if you use too much. And yet, you know, sometimes we'll want to use a cliche. She'll teach things like cliche play, where you're writing fresh, really yeah. writing fresh, and you're theming your body language to the whole novel. And, oh, there's just beautiful, beautiful flow um, and, and just wonderful techniques that you can learn to use. And she'll give you examples, and then she'll be like, now take this scene in your novel and do this and, and try this and see, you know, then read it before and read it after. And so you're all, all of the practicing is done on your own book. Yeah. Um, and, and so that's, I, I recommend that kind of thing as well. Yeah. And for other stuff, again, I'm sorry, this is a bit of a book heavy episode as I okay, tell you fine. all about all the books that ever existed. Everybody recommends Strunk and White for basic writing um, yep. style. It is very good. It is the classic. This is an alternative that is lighter and more fun. Uh, it's called Sin and Syntax. Um, it goes through the basic, it goes through the parts of speech. It's full of um, exercises for how you can use those in new and fresh and evocative ways. It is really, really fun. 
Uh, I was reading it on the beach last summer and everybody thought I was mad and I was just laughing to myself as I read it. I was laughing to myself as I read a grammar book. Mm -hmm. It is wonderful. So another, if you're looking for more kind of craft style stuff where you're like, yes, I, I've got my characters showing their emotions and now I'm looking to do more showing and, and evocative writing of my, my spaces and, you know, my, my narration and this kind of stuff. That's that's a really good a good one to to check out. I I suddenly looking at my table and realizing that we will need to do a blog post about all of these, um, all of these books. Delaney, you're going to send me your recommendations as well. Yes, and we're going to get have them all written up in a blog post for you. Have you seen the deluxe transitive vampire? No, and I can't a, believe I have lived until this age and not seen that. Tell me everything. that is that is that is a grammar book. I'm trying to pull up here so I can tell you the author's name. Um, Karen Elizabeth Gordon, the ultimate handbook of grammar for the innocent, the eager and the doomed. Oh, the deluxe amazing. transitive vampire. It is awesome. It is illustrated. Um, it's very gothic. In, in, in its in its illustrations and it's just lovely. And it's another one that you will find yourself absolutely laughing as you're reading a grammar book and you'll actually enjoy it. I don't have it here because my daughter stole it. That's so, great. you know. I think, I think I'm uh, I think I'm getting that for myself for Valentine's Day. <laughs> it's <laughs> a good Valentine's one. Valentine's Day to me. It's a really good one. <laughs> so beta readers, managing beta readers, it can be a handful. What are your tips? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What like what do you tell them and how do you manage them? Oh, um, some of the advice out there is to ask them specific questions. And I will I will put an asterisk next to that. Don't ask too many questions. Um, I have been asked to do a beta read on a book and they gave me three pages of questions. And I had to say, you know what, I don't have time to to do this book because I don't have time to fill out the novel that you want me to write in response, yeah. even though I'm quite wordy if you've ever received one of my emails. But um, <laughs> I'm a novelist. My husband says, don't ask a novelist to write an email. Um, and, you know, it, it, so you, you want to set up realistic expectations. Um, you know, you need to let them know that you don't want to hear this is great. That's not that's not feedback that's useful. I want useful, actionable feedback. Um, if if a section pleases you, let me know. If you're laughing, let me know. If you hate it, let me know. You know, give me both the positive and the negative. Um, let me know your emotions at different places in it. You know, if you're reading a scene and it's making you angry, that may be what I intended, and so that's fine. Um, as long as you forgive me by the end of the book, um, you know. And, and then, um, as much as I have to admit, I'm not a big fan of a whole lot of beta readers. I do say have a few um, because one of my books um, I had, you know, I had resisted. Margie had said, you need to change this intro. And I'm like, no, this is, this is the big secret. And it's the big reveal at the end of the book. Um, and half of my beta readers couldn't get through the intro mm -hmm. because they were sensing that there was a big secret and they wanted to know it. And they were disturbed. Um, and, and the ones that did, they loved the book and they were like, this is fantastic. And so we actually shifted the big reveal to, yeah, to the very first part of the book. So it's like the first paragraph, you find the big reveal. And I thought, you know, great, I'm going to have to rewrite the whole book. It turned out I didn't have to. Um, I, I sat and pouted for about three months before going back to do the rewrite and then realized, well, wow, that was two hours worth of work. I pouted over for three months. Um, you know, Processing and, time. And, Processing time is okay. Yeah. And then, you know, going back and reading, I'm like, oh, I see. Now, now I get it. It makes the whole thing stronger because the reader isn't wondering why. Um, you know, now the reader is is involved and like they know the secret. So it's like, when is it going to come out? Well, how is it going to come out? Dramatic irony. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it works in your favor. Sometimes you do want to tell the reader something. You just don't want the characters to know. Yeah. Dramatic irony, guys. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's being open to listening to that feedback too and having people that you trust that you know. But at the same time, if your beta readers are telling you something that you're like, no, this destroys my, you know, this this is the heart of my book. This destroys my book. I can't do that. Remember, you're the writer. You don't have to take the advice. You can say, thank you. I appreciate, you can stay friends. You can say, thank you. You know, you can appreciate their, their content and you can still not do it. Yeah. You know, yeah, absolutely. Uh, MH Biscop says, 
One of my big secrets is that I need to reveal much earlier than I wanted to also. That would be part of my current editing. I have to do the opposite. I do a lot of expo dumps and then, uh, yeah, because I'm like, oh, it would be so cool if this were true. And then I write it all out in my first draft. And then I'm like, oh, I have a large clump of information that I need to do exposition on proper carefully weaved in exposition mm -hmm. and that's part of the drafting process like meeting mm -hmm. out information is part of pacing yeah um that's that's okay that's something that we know we need to fix i always tell my beta readers i want to know your internal dialogue as you're reading the book like if you're mm -hmm. laughing i want to know if you're going hey what's going on here and then you find out a paragraph later it's still useful that i know that you're wondering there Mm -hmm. Now, it may be that I want that, and it may be that I don't want that, and maybe I didn't realize it, but I did want it all along. But, like, if I ask my beta readers, just tell me what's going through your head as you're reading, I get loads of funny comments and, like, emoji laughs and this kind of thing. And then I get lots of question marks. It's just like, mm -hmm. um, and that's absolutely <laughs> fine. And then occasionally I'll get a sensible comment, like, didn't he just say this? Or, in the last chapter, he said such and such. Or, why is this a problem now when before he was absolutely fine with this? And that's great. Like, that's what beta readers are for as well. They help you, you know, match up bits that when you were writing, it kind of made sense. And then something changed and then you didn't quite get there. And beta readers are great for that. Beta readers, honestly, continuity is continuity and feeling. That's what you want from beta readers. Yeah. Like, your book should be at the, at the place where, like, those are the issues, I think. Yeah, I agree. So what about novel writing tools that can help you? Um, because I think that we are in an age now where there are a lot of tools out there that can help writers. I've shared all of my books. We, we I think we're good for books. Um, but there's a lot of other tools out there that people try or people wonder about or they don't even know about. Um, do you have any that you particularly recommend uh, or any you particularly don't recommend? Well, you know, I'm the biggest World Anvils fangirl. So for me, those are, those are, you know, that, that you've got the tools built in there. Um, other than that, I do like Pro Writing Aid. I find that helps a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I use that one too. I found it very useful. It spots a lot of my, ha, huh, you're using this verb a lot. Mm -hmm. Maybe we could stop doing that. Um, mm -hmm. Some of those, those things where, for those of you who don't know, Pro Writing Aid, I'm not paid to say this. Pro Writing Aid is, um, it's similar to Grammarly, but I feel mm -hmm. like it's more oriented for fiction writers. Yeah. Um, and it's got a lot of interesting education in the software as well. It has a free uh, Chrome plugin that does a bunch of, uh, not just spell checking, works with World Anvil as well, by the way, does a bunch of spell checking, but it also spots basic grammar issues, like where you have just made up made together the words wrong, it will spot that and help you. And they also have uh, an editor on their platform that also integrates with, with other software as well, which is um, more chunky and it can tell you a lot of stuff about like, is your style correct? Are you are you using too many like ing words or lee words? So that's garants and, ad and um, adverbs, for example. Um, and it helps you tighten up your style really and spot words that you overuse that kind of thing do you think that's a fair estimation mm -hmm. of pro writing aid absolutely and and bonus if you're trying to do seo on blog posts it's really good believe it or not <laughs> ah, i didn't know that because cool. i i know i it, it it spots things like passive voice and that kind of thing which as as a writer as a novelist sometimes you want that sometimes you don't you know so you can ignore it but it's it's actually really good at highlighting yeah it's it's i, I find it very useful in, yeah. in pretty much everything, yeah. um, including cutting down my emails. Um, huh? I would say if uh, somebody said, I'm getting it now, it has a free version. Go and try yeah. it out. Try the free. For you. Not every tool is for yeah. every writer. So don't, yeah. just because we recommend it and it worked for us, does not mean that you should like go out and buy it right now. Yeah. Um, I, I don't want that on my conscience, but um, it was. I got a fifty percent off after winning Nano one time. You know, fifty percent off lifetime. You know, what you can't. So you know, keep an eye out for sales and stuff too. Um, other tools, I, you know, I, seriously, not a Margie Lawson commercial, but um, just because I've worked so much with her, her deep editing. If you can learn her deep editing method, um, use that repeatedly. 
Um, it's it takes a book from a really good book to like New York Times bestseller level. Good. It's it's just it's that level, um, and you can use it at different phases in the process to help you see. Um, and so sometimes it it helps um, it just helps you see where things are. For example, when you're talking about that big section of of backstory, it's a color coded system. You can mm -hmm. literally color code it, sit it across this. You can put your pages across the room, and you can see the problems from across the room. It's bizarre. Um, and and so then it tells you, you know, if you have this big chunk, this is what you do with it. Yeah. Um, that's really. I don't have a whole lot of other tools that I that I recommend at the writing stage um, because it's just get on World Anvil um, and, and get the words in there and, and, and do it, you know, whatever you need to use to work. If, eventually, you're going to be working with an editor. And so whatever the editor needs is usually the extra tool we have to add. So um, like my editor can only work in Word. Um, we're working on that. We're trying to work in getting her into so where we can work in World Anvil, but she's Editors are deliberately and wonderfully, I'm sure she's listening. You're wonderful. I love you. Um, persnickety. We want them to be. Yes. We want them to be. Um, she recently saved a book from having a disaster in it. Um, yeah, just several books I've watched her save for people. Um, oh, wow. You know, because she she wouldn't let go of something. It was bugging her and she wouldn't let go of it. Whereas the author, you know, you're going to be like, well, I know what I'm doing. You know, I've got my dates right, you know, and she's she's like, I don't think that happened then, you know, and, and show me where your source is for that. And, you know, making you go and dig out the source and, you know, or, you know, in, in your book, you said this happened and now this has happened and I've got your map here. And that, you know, they can't be in a forest because it's a plane, you know, and, you know, that's great. That's what you need. Yeah. Yeah. You need had, that stage afterwards. I had Demetrius do this to me with one with uh, actually the novel I'm working on right now, where he was like, "You've got a problem with your timing. Your timing doesn't make sense." And I was like, "It's fine. It's okay." It's like, no, your timing's. If they're here at the equinox, they cannot be here in March. That yeah. doesn't. And I planned it all out on Chronicles, and I was like, "Oh crap, he's right." <laughs> <laughs> and I had to, I had to like reorder a bunch of stuff. It made the novel so much better. And now I have, and because I'm also more time conscious now, it, I don't want to bore you with my novel crap, but like I'm more time conscious. So I've got like more like actual time shows rather yeah. than tells in there. It's, it's a better book for it. Um, that's the joy of like editors and, and beta readers and, and alpha readers. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They teach you, you teach you and you, it changes your writing. That's why when you go to write your second book, you're going to be a completely different, you know, different techniques, different approaches. Um, you know, it's, it's going to be changing. I mean, the particular author who had the time problem, the next book, every scene had a timestamp. <laughs> every scene had a timestamp. See, I've checked it. I've checked it. I've checked it. But a lot of, a lot of the writers that I admire, when I think about it, I admire them because of that specificity, because I feel yeah. like I'm really there because of the specificity. And that that's something you learn from beta readers and editors being like, but what's happening? Where are we? When are we? What's going on? Why does this make sense? Um, so yeah, it is a, a whole gro growth process, getting all the way to the other side of the mountain to pick up the, the um, yeah. metaphor we were using before. And you want that feedback then, even though you may not, enjoy getting it you want it then because if you don't get it then you will get it in the reviews yeah and you don't want it in the reviews you want the reviews to say oh this holds together so well as opposed to yeah there's this weird time thing that goes on yeah absolutely like you want it so you can fix it right mm -hmm. um yeah <laughs> um uh mando max says are your drafts generally done in manuscripts too i do all of my drafts are manuscripts. Mm -hmm. uh, as you guys believe, I firmly believe in uh, what we call on the team, eating our own dog food. Uh, so <laughs> I write all of my novels on World Anvil. I write all of my world building in manuscripts. I do all of my plotting in either plot templates or whiteboards. Um, and uh, I run all of my campaigns on World Anvil as well. Yeah. Because you know all what? My, if uh... I'm going to make a software, I'm going to use the software. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's too good. It's it's too good not to use it. Um, 
you know, I have so many tools available to me because of the industry I'm in. But for me, when I'm writing, it's it's World Anvil. And it's uh, World Anvil presents a really clean document. And it separates formatting from writing, which is something a lot of people haven't experienced before. So you have to get get your head wrapped around that. But um, you're focused on your, your writing and on the story. And it's creating something that later you're going to be really glad that it's clean when you come to the end. Um, and yeah, I just absolutely, absolutely draft and, and everything all the way to the end. I'd like to be very clear. I did not ask her or tell her or pay her to say no. that. No, no. <laughs> No, I, I used to use, um, of all things, Evernote. Oh, yeah. um, I've tried Scrivener. I've tried Word. Um, I've tried a whole bunch of different writing software and a whole bunch of different world building software. And that is why when I found World Anvil and I found the World Anvil manuscripts, I was, I mean, you didn't have to pay me because you already knew. Um, I, I grabbed onto World Anvil with both hands and said, I need a lifetime membership. And well, we don't have lifetime memberships. No, I need a lifetime membership. Well, we don't have lifetime memberships. I see some people have lifetime memberships. I need a life. I was a pest. But it's because for me, it's like, this is the software. I can tell I'm going to use this for all my writing. This is it. So we yeah. have a bunch of questions that I feel like we should make sure we answer because you guys mm -hmm. have shown up and you've listened and you've chatted and you've shared your thoughts so well. Uh, really, it's the least we can do. Yes. Um, how do you keep yourself accountable is a great question from Sunny Bird Boy. I think particularly in the first draft, it's a big challenge to get to the end. Staying accountable. How do you manage it, Delena? Folks in the chat, feel free to share. Hmm. Um, let people know that you're doing it and, and let friends know to ask how you're doing it. Um, for me, um, one of the things I had to do, um, which has alarmed a lot of people, is I had to step back from a lot of my money-making ventures. And so it's like, okay, I have, I have given up on a lot of stuff so that I can focus on my writing. If I'm not doing my writing, I am doing a disservice to friends and and myself, and I have to. Um, so for me, it's it's a huge thing. I think also it's um, Thomas Kincaid said in a in a talk one time that if you are an artist, you can't not art. If you are if you can, if you can like not do it, maybe you shouldn't. Um, and, I, and I don't mean that in any way negatively, but if, you, if you're a writer and you stop writing for a long period of time, you're going to start having mental illness. <laughs> you're going to start going nuts. Um, your friends will start going, hey, what's wrong with you? You know, and so that helps keep me accountable, too. It's like if, if you can't, how can I say it? If you can't not do it, you have to do it. So um, there's that. Um as far as actual techniques, one thing that a lot of the folks in the Discord have taught me, and I'm still trying to get my head around this one, is live streaming writing sections, committing to doing things like that where you've got people who are holding you accountable. Whatever you need to do to get other people or yourself so that you can feel accountable, so that you can get that, um, you know, that endorphin rush, right, that I have done it. Get yourself into that place where having done it gives you that rush. Um, gamify it however you however you can whatever that looks like for you yeah absolutely uh, gamification is great word counts competitive word sprints write-ins mm -hmm. um, these are all ways to keep yourself motivated uh, honestly I tried something new since January and it's kind of I know it's February so it's a, it's early to say but it's turned my life around yeah. I sit down and write first thing in the morning <sighs> I don't, so I can do this. I'm very lucky because A, I am my own boss and B, uh, the rest of my team does not wake up as early as me because time zone. So I start writing at nine o'clock in the morning and I do not finish nice. until 11 o'clock in the morning. So I do two hours of writing in the morning. When I was working for another company, I would write at uh, seven. So I would write before my day. And what that meant for me personally is I would prioritize it. That meant nothing else happened until the writing had happened. And then I could get on with my day, happy in the knowledge that I had done my writing for the day and everything was going to be okay. And 
it's also just so good for my mental health. I'm not going to burden you with my issues, but um, it really helps me in ways that are not attached to my writing. But finding a way to do it every day for at the same time has been great. And when I was writing at 7 a.m., I was only writing for 35 minutes. I wasn't writing for a very long time because that is that that was the time I had. But that was 35 minutes every day. And all of a sudden I started getting my book written. And that motivation was enough to keep me going because once I felt that it was moving, I wanted it to keep moving. And it, then it was easier to sit down at 7 a.m. when I was really tired and I'd got to bed at two because I'd had a performance and I still get up at seven at right. Um, I, that was quite a long answer. I hope that was helpful, but that was something that really helped me particularly. Mm -hmm. And if you're more of a night owl, do it at night. Mm -hmm. like find, find the time that is for you, but commit the time. Cause that's really the only way it's going to happen is by committing your time and saying, this is the time. Books mm -hmm. stubbornly refuse to write themselves. It is outrageous. And I'll add, if you're one of those people that time, um, is not your friend and having things scheduled leaves you a little twitchy like like me um if you have a calendar and you something you can mark off i did my writing today wherever in the day that is i did my writing today once you start getting a streak then it gets harder to break it because you're like i've done it for three months now i am not going to miss today that's one of the things that with nano works really well for me you know, you've got that, you've got that graph and you can see the word counts going up. You don't want to have a day that goes, Zoop. you know, you, even if I only write 500 words today, I will sit down and I will write the 500 words, you know, even if it's 2 a.m., you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah absolutely. Uh, Lily G. Nack or Lily Gnack, I'm not sure, uh, says, I never seem happy with my descriptions. Do you have any advice or a good book or tool to help? So first of all, get a rough draft of the description down. It's seriously, be willing to let it be good enough and go on. Um, fix it in the editing, fix it in, in, in the later stage. Take some time, daydream, um, you know, let yourself get into that scene where you're actually, you know, whatever, whatever works for you to, to get to where you can really see the scene and go through your senses. What am I seeing? What am I hearing? What am I smelling? What am I tasting? What am I, you know, all of that. And um, then try to figure out what you can work in. You don't have to include all of that because that's too much. Um, but find the pieces like um, if there's a particular scent that is going to affect somebody emotionally, you know, I'll use that, um, you know, do whatever you can to make that setting come alive for you um, is, is my general information. What, what do you have, Janet, on that one? I would be honest. For me, descriptions are like a draft two thing or a draft three thing. Descriptions mm -hmm. don't appear in my first draft. They could be standing in the air. God knows what they are. That, that things are happening. There are character things happening in character ways that are important. If, if I need something, like I need a boat because I need to get on it, there is a boat. And sometimes I'll have a flash of inspiration in draft one and I'll be like, yes, and the salty smell of something, something, and the rattle of the, the ropes or something. Sometimes if it comes, in it goes. I don't worry about descriptions in draft one. Descriptions are a draft three problem. Um, because by draft three, I know what I want that description to do. And that makes it a hundred times easier to write. Am I trying to make the space intriguing? Am I trying to make it threatening? Am I trying to make it wondrous? And then suddenly, I, once I know what it's supposed to do, I know which bits to describe to make it do that. Um, so I find writing description in isolation very difficult. The minute I know what I want my description to achieve, it is a hundred times easier and then five senses, five senses it up. What does it smell like? What does it sound like? What's it taste like? What's the air taste like? Um, does the ground feel hard beneath your feet or is it soft and spongy and delightful? You know, does the wind cut against your cheek or is it a, a breeze that like strokes your hair? Like what's, that's what the description is for. 
the description does a lot more than just and then there's a table and there's a chair and there's a light and there are some books. Um, so yeah, descriptions are really hard to write until you know what they're supposed to do. Don't worry about them until you've figured out everything else that's going on. And then you add them in and you can see them as a, like an intensifier of the emotions that are going on in the scene. And that's my advice with descriptions. One of my alpha readers once said that everything happened in a white room mm. throughout all of my, you know, it, because it was that early of a draft. Um, and I actually wrote in a white room just because I was being annoying. Um, <laughs> sorry, I got you. <laughs> you know, that was almost but, a spit take. Yeah, and also, you know, uh, you know, being a little bit sarcastic, but uh, you may be a screenwriter at heart, you know, yeah. just, just, just be aware of, you know, these are your strengths, these are your weaknesses, but yeah, in the polishing stage, you can come up with some beautiful descriptions later, right? because then you know where you're going. Um, early on, you may not even use this scene again. So, you know, you can put, you know, square brackets, you know, cool description here, just keep going. Don't let yeah, it stop you. Be. Don't let it I'm bother you. One of the things that early drafts often suffer for, we didn't get to the mistakes writers make, um, but one of the things early drafts suffer from is conversations happening statically in a vacuum with nothing else going on. Yeah. And that's where you don't necessarily want to write a big description of the space because you might move the scene somewhere else or you might say, okay, but they're also trying to cross a river or they're also trying to climb a tree or they're also, you know, sparring or something and then and then you need to make sure that the thing that they're doing makes sense in the place that they are which means that probably you move it and yeah that's why i like to write them out. <laughs> exactly. okay a question from miss sizette how do you fill scenes as in for words despite my plotting and sometimes wordiness i cannot for the life of me make a scene last for more than 900 words or so then i want to write more scenes However, especially for this novel, a slower pace is needed, and I have no idea what to do with it. I have an idea about this, but you go first, Elena. Now, I want to hear your idea, because I wonder if we're going the same direction. Are you writing reactions? Mm -hmm. One of the things that young writers do, and first drafters do, and first draft young writers do, I still do it, is we write out what happens. With By the end of the first draft, we have a great a great list of things that happened, which is fantastic, but it's not a novel. A novel is things that happen to people and the way they dealt with them. So often it sounds like you might be missing the, oh, we got away from them, but oh my God, did you realize that they had this thing? I can't even believe it. And then she died. What are we gonna do? How can we go on without her? This is a foundational moment for my character. I just, I need a minute. Um, it's so easy to forget those moments when you're driving through, especially if you're a plotter and you're like, I must get to the next plot point. I do this too. I am not judging. Um, and then you go back and you're like, huh, my characters have not had very many slow emotional moments. I wonder why that is. It's because you've forgotten the reactions. So mm -hmm. make sure every time a big thing happens to a character, they have a chance to actually have a reaction. And A, your scenes will get longer. Um, and B, you will also um, have more living characters that feel more vital so that is my diagnosis that problem and i wouldn't worry about it until later get through they get through draft one however you can i really i really believe yeah. in that adage for me go ahead Delon. margie calls it impact on the point of view character mm. it's an impact that's there also look for things like um they paused there is never a pause that doesn't have an emotional component. And so it's really easy for us to say, you know, he looked away or, you know, these little, you know, and they're, they're almost throwaway places. And um, again, Margie has a lesson called dig for the truth, dig into that scene, into what's going on in each character. You don't have to put all of that in there, but make sure that you know it and make sure that it's shown somehow. So, you know, in the body language of that character, if you have just, you know, if the point of view character has just said something that is earth shattering to the other character that's on screen, they need to take a moment and react. Um, and so, and then of course, you know, are your descriptions well enough? You know, what, what have you missed? Um, and, and that goes back to the whole, the whole system of what's missing. Um, but definitely you want to have, um, 
there's another tool that I wish I could remember. You'll probably remember it. Motivation reaction units. So there's mm, motivation. Yeah, and there's action, the MRU. Yeah. yeah. There's, there's a, there's a whole book that's very technical and geeky and I should remember the name of the author and I don't, 50s, I think. yeah, it's an older one, yeah. but it's, it's their MRUs. So it's the character does something and then there's a reaction and then that reaction causes another thing to happen. And, you know, so make sure that those are there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so get and again, if it feels like things are too fast and everything's going too fast and also your scenes feel short, often that's why. Uh, and it's okay to have short scenes, by the way. It's not a problem. Mm -hmm. Like some some writers just write shorter scenes, and I always end up with longer scenes after several edits. That's the other thing. Like I had exactly the same thing with the book I'm writing. I pushed to get to the end. I realized there weren't enough reactions. I put in the reactions. Suddenly, my scenes were you know two thousand words rather than nine hundred words, um, and they felt a bit chunkier. Um, but it's okay if you want short scenes as well. That's also fun. Some genres are just short scenes. Yeah. And exactly. it's, it depends on what you're writing. Yeah. We have, um, you may not know the answer to this one. I don't think I do. A question from Surayan. I'm interested in analyzing the mechanics of how a particular authorial style slash syntax makes me feel a particular mm -hmm. way. Can you suggest mm -hmm. resources that teach mm -hmm. how to break down syntax in this way? I'm looking mm -hmm. ideally for a university level material. Yeah, go and get the lecture packet from Margie Lawson on empowering characters' emotions. Get that one, that's her first one, that's her base level. Um, if you need to go deeper, her second one is deep editing rhetorical styles and more. The third one is the writing body language and dialogue cues. That teaches you a technique that she has used and she has developed by analyzing New York Times bestselling novels. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so it teaches you a technique that it's, it's a highlighting technique. You've got highlighters. I've you know, got highlighters everywhere around here and you can go through and you can actually highlight. Um, it's going to teach you how the, to, to see the rhetorical devices, to recognize the rhetorical devices. Um, it's going to teach you to really analyze this, the scenes. And she's got a whole bunch of webinars and stuff that she will actually live analyze scenes and you'll see how she's using it and that is what that is it's in analyzing the mechanics of a particular style and you know you can you know you're not copying that author right but what she has a thing called frame it build it where you actually break down the structure okay rhetorical device you know this rhetorical device with this rhetorical device and this was how the paragraph came together and you can actually break it down into the framework and then you can try it with your own writing Amazing. So, and um, and that's better than any MR, any, um, yeah, it's good. You'll like it. It'll it sounds it. fantastic. I'm, I'm sold. <laughs> I, I think I'm going to need to go check out Margie Lawson's stuff because she sounds like a genius. <laughs> I, I had a, a writer that I, I taught this material to and she was rewriting her thing and she said, I almost feel guilty because I'm manipulating my, my readers emotions so strongly in this. And I'm like, yes, that's the point. She's like, I didn't realize that. And so that was the thing she said was she would, she went back to her favorite novels and analyzed her favorite novels and how they were using techniques. Rhetorical devices are powerful things. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the very last question, I'm sorry, we have gone on because you're too fascinating to Lena. <laughs> At what point do you think it's edited enough I can start trying to publish this. Ask the oncoming hoop. Um, there's going to come a point where you hate it. That's you're getting close. Um, get if you can get a chance to have some level of a professional editor um, go through it with you. You're you're never it, it. The cost is often staggering and frightening, but you're never going to regret it afterwards. Um, if, as long as you get a good editor get, please, 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 please be careful with editors, um, get referrals, have them do a sample edit. Um, a bad editor can destroy a book, a good editor can make it. Um, part of the publishing process is one last polish. Mm. And um, I, I think you know, we talked about biggest mistakes, publishing too soon is the biggest mistake um, that I've ever seen. Um, the second one is thinking you're going to make a lot of money on this. Um, <laughs> do not pay. There's a, there's a, there's a really good book, uh, writer dad. Um, 
which I should remember his name and I don't, but it, it's writer dad who, who tells his life story of becoming a writer. And he was so sure he was going to become rich. He put the mortgage on the, on the credit card. No. Yeah. Yeah. He oh. lost everything. Now it has a happy ending, but um, you know, there's some mistakes. Um, yeah. And you know, I, and I've seen that one. I've seen that one more often than you would think. I see that one a lot. Yeah, I had somebody contact me. I'm in trouble. I need to write something to get out of financial trouble. And I said, that's not how that works. Do you need to go work at Walmart or something? That's not how this is going to work. This is not going to solve it. It's not that you won't make money, but it's it's not instantaneous like that. Yeah, it's not a magic money fix, sadly. If no, it were, more people would be writing novels, guys. Uh, exactly well and, and yeah even that a lot of people are that think it is but yeah um you know but you'll get it you'll get a sense of it um especially if you're working with good friends that are good beta readers and you know you've got to that stage and you you will get to a point where you are absolutely sick of it um and and unfortunately quite often that's that's the stage where you're really close to that yeah, I have writer friends who also who also say exactly that. that essentially, I I've read through this thing so much that I am absolutely sick of it. It's probably ready. Probably ready. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that comes from both sides, I think. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Um, we have done uh, self publishing uh, talks here before uh, that you may find in our VODs. And you may find self-publishing talks in the future. As always, if you have specific requests for things that you want to hear on these streams, on these podcasts, then let me know. I am very easy to find. You can find me on Twitter. You can find me on Discord. I exist in the space. Um, and uh, I always want to hear what you guys want to hear about because that's literally my job is to help you. Isn't that nice? I get to help you guys. So tell me what you want to hear about and I will make sure you get more amazing guests like the amazing Delena. Delena, just before you go, where can we find your wonderful work? Delena.com, or if you want my world anvil, it's Delena.rocks. A friend of mine gave me that domain and I couldn't resist throwing that, up, so it redirects to my world anvil page. Um, yeah. Amazing, Delena.rocks, that's where you'll find her, or Delena.com. <laughs> Delena, thank you so much for all of your wisdom today. If there's one takeaway you will leave our beans with, how to write a novel, what is that? I'm distracted because Sudan is sad. But um, yeah, <laughs> um, it is it is an emotional it, it is emotional process. This is this is your heart. Um, you know, you're, you're just bleeding on the page. Um, take good care of your emotional health. Take good care of yourself um, and, and, you know, love yourself through the entire process. And don't don't think I'm the only person who's ever felt this way. It's like, no, no, that that actually is very close to every writer um, that, that, you know, that would be. Yeah. Let me take care. Uh, and I think my my leaving words are, how do you write a novel? Just like you bite, you uh, eat an elephant one bite <laughs> at a time, one step at a time. Keep walking through the mountains. Um, keep taking those steps. Do not worry that sometimes the steps seem to lead you round in a circle. That is part of the process. It's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, we can't, exactly. We don't have a perfect map because until you've written a novel, you don't know how it works for you, and it is different for everybody. So keep going forward, keep taking steps, do not be discouraged. And remember that it takes time. And every step that you take is practice. But that's what's got me through. Every time we go on a writing step, it is progress and I'm learning something. I think that is a good place to leave you guys. Big love to you all. Grab your hammer and go world build. Bye beans. Bye.